Hey guys, today we're going to code a tic-tac-toe game in Java starting from scratch. You're going to see the whole thing, the thought process behind it, the mistakes I make, if any. And before we get started here, guys, I want you to know the full source code of this completed tic-tac-toe game is available in the link down in the description. So go grab it. Don't just grab it and use it to cheat. Grab it so you can pull it down and mess with it and play with it and improve upon it and break stuff and mess around with it. Have fun with it. And if you like having that source code, please let me know by liking the video. It really means so much to me. Thank you. So yeah, we're going to work it out as we go. So let's get to it. So for this game example, we're just going to do the output like in the console and not use a GUI or anything that just to keep it simple and work through the logic of how to create a tic-tac-toe game. We're going to make sure we can print the board and then take user input and put it in the right place. We need to have some kind of a computer opponent that does some kind of moves and also we need to be able to check if the game is over meaning if the player or the computer has won or if the board is full and nobody has won then we've got a tie so those are kind of all the little pieces i'm thinking of there may be more to it as we work it out but who knows let's get going so first let's just uh, come up with a way to print a board so we can look at the console and see what's happening i think the board that we're going to have is a probably a 2d array of char of characters so you can imagine they all start out blank and then we'll turn them into x's or o's depending on if the computer or the, the human player places something there so um let's just start out with that so we've got char double array and if you don't understand the multi-dimensional or 2d arrays it's not so bad here you're, you're probably familiar with regular arrays like this this is just an array of characters and this you can kind of just think as a, a grid of characters and and we'll type out what it looks like uh, when we declare it so call it board good name for a board and we're going to uh, but essentially what we want is three rows of three characters a piece so we can come up with that grid so we're going to start out with all of them being just blank spaces and then later on when they get filled in there'll be x's and o's so we're going to declare our um, board with just spaces. So the first array, the first row will be space, space, space. And then um, it'll be the same for the second row. So we'll copy that, paste that, and then of course, same for the third. And that's it. That's essentially our, our game board. Now, um, let, let me reformat that to kind of show to get a better representation of what uh, of what the board actually looks like here. So this spot here is the top left spot on our game board. And this one's the bottom right and everything else fits in exactly how you would expect. So now let's um, just come up with a way that we can print the board. So, so to print the board, we not only want to print what's in each of these um, spots, but we also want to print the, the grid, the hashtag, the pound. Uh, between all of these spots. So um, to do that, I think what we're going to do is like for the example for the top row, we'll print this first value, then we'll print a vertical bar and then print the second value and then print a vertical bar and then this third value. And then we'll have like a, a we'll print out a line separator and then we'll print the second row similarly to how we did the first row and so on until we get the whole thing printed. So um, let's just write out a system that out dot print line. So first we want to print out this top left spot and to get that spot um, it's the zeroth spot the first the first is the zeroth the zeroth spot on the zeroth array so we can reference that by just board zero zero but let's actually go ahead and test that we can refer to that spot just by let's say we this was an x and we run our program, it prints out an X. It is success, board zero, zero is successfully referencing this first spot. So now let's change that back before we mess something up. And then um, we want to print a vertical bar and then um, board zero, one. Still the first, the zeroth row, and then the second spot in it is one. Not two, nope one all right and then uh, we just got one more if we want to print the third spot here and i'm sorry this line's going pretty long that's okay okay so let's just test that out real quick x o o 
run, bam, we've got our first row. Um, now let's print the, um, the row of like a line separator. So I'm thinking under that first spot, we just have a hyphen. And then I think we do a, a plus sign so we can get the, the cross part of the hashtag pound. Um, and then uh, hyphen plus hyphen. Uh, let's see how that looks. So we're going to copy this first line and we'll just, we're just going to change what we're printing here. So we're going to change, um, we're going to do the first row for everything. We, the first row meaning the second row. This row. We're now printing this row. So we got one zero, one one, and one two. Cool, cool, cool. And then we're going to print this separator again. We're just copy that, paste it. And then let's do our third row. So we've got two zero, two one, and two two. So let's just try this out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You get the drill here. Nine. Cool. All right, let's expand this so we can see it. Awesome. We can print our board. So now what we probably want to do is move all of this printing out to its own method so we can call it whenever we need to, because we're going to print the board many times during this uh, program's running. Um, so we, you know how you can do that. You can write out like private, um, void, print. But, but if you're working in an IDE, quick tip, I'm working in Eclipse right now. I can highlight all of this and I can either right click and go to uh, refactor extract method or I can just hit alt shift M with all of this highlighted. So I'm going to do that alt shift M and you just tell it the name of the method that you want this to be. But guess what? We're going to call it print board. And look, awesome. It made it a private static void print board takes in the character array of the board and prints it out. So now whenever we want to print out the current state of the board, all we have to do is call that method. And now we can forget about this completely, put it out of your mind. It's already written. And whenever we want to print the board, we can just print the board. All right, now again, before I forget, I'm just going to change all these back to blanks. And now that we know that we can print the board, we don't need to really mess with that anymore. So now we need to have a way to take user input, like say I want to put my X in this spot here, or I want to put it here. We want to be able to take the user's input and put it in the right spot. So I think what we're going to do is instead of making the user like type in zero, zero, or zero, one, nobody wants to do that. We're probably going to allow them to type in one of these numbers for these positions. So if they want to insert it into the top left, they'll give it, they'll enter a one. If they want to insert it in the middle, they'll give it a five, et cetera. So first let's just do the simple part of um, taking in that number from the user. And to do, do that, we're going to use um, a, the scanner class. So we'll do scanner scanner equals new scanner. And we're going to use system.in for the user input. We're going to organize imports so we can automatically import Java Util Scanner. And by the way, that was Control Shift O in Eclipse to automatically do that. And if you, by the way, if you want a full tutorial on the scanner and how to get user input with it, go ahead and click this link up here. I've got a whole video on it. It's great. All right, so we're going to um, get the input from the user as a string. String user input equals um, scanner dot next line, and that gets the line entered by the user and puts it in this user and it puts it in this user input uh, variable. And let's go ahead and test that too. I like testing. System that out that print line user input. Oh, and we might also want to prompt the user. Um, where would you like to play? Kind of weird, but hey, that's I guess the best thing I can think of right now. Doesn't matter. And we'll we'll tell them uh, one through nine, so they know what that one to input. So let's go ahead and give that a test. And now it says, where would you like to play? One through nine, and we can say one, and it prints out one. So cool, we're getting that input right. Now what we want to be able to do is take this user input and actually place the X. We'll, we'll, we'll make player one the X. We want to be able to place the X in the spot where they asked it to go. So we can use a big uh, like if else block or we can use a switch statement. And for, for ones with a lot of options like this, I kind of like to use a switch statement. So what we're going to say is switch on the value of the user input. And then in the case, get over there that the user input is um, one, 
we want to assign this value as x, right? So case one is uh, board 0, 0, set equal to an x. Oh, and this is a string, not an int, so we're going to just put quotes around that. And then we want to remember to add our break statements. You just want to remember to add breaks whenever you uh, write your switch statements. Otherwise, you could have you have potential for some weird behavior. Just put in breaks. So that's we're going to copy and paste for the other eight values. So two would be zero one, the spot here, or sorry, zero one, the spot here, and so on. Okay, so that should be all of them. I'm going to zoom out actually a little bit so you can actually see all of this for just a second. Um, and we're going to fix the formatting on this. I don't know why I formatted it like that. And as you can see, we've got a case for each of what a user should put in. And if they put in something else, we'll put in some validation for that later on. But for right now, we're going to have a default statement. So if they don't send one through nine, we're just going to be sad. Um, so default, that means if none of those are met, it'll just, it'll just pronounce sad face. And then after we've gotten the input from the user and assigned the right spot on the board with an X, let's go ahead and print the board again, which now that we've got a method, we can just say print board. That's it. Print board board. And let's run it. Where would you like to play? Um, three. And bam, we get an X on the three spot. How awesome is that, right? You're making a game. It's really cool. Even simple games like this are just a lot of fun to make. So let's clean this up a bit and um, extract all of this stuff that's getting uh, the printing the, the message to the user, getting the input and putting it in the right spot on the board. Let's put that in its own method too. So Alt Shift M, um, player turn. Hit OK. And now whenever we want the player to take a turn, it's all right there. And if we need to enhance it or do anything else special in there, we can just fix up this player turn method. Let's go ahead and zoom in back a little bit here. Actually, we, we don't need this um, print line of what the user input anymore. We can get rid of that. So now this method for the player turn just prints out, where would you like to play? Takes the input from the user, puts it in the right spot, and returns. Awesome. So now, we come what, so now we're coming to what might seem like a complicated part, and that's how to get the computer's turn to work. Um, so you might be thinking, hi, am I going to write some kind of really complex algorithm to do all the optimal stuff? We're not going to worry about that here. We're just going to make the computer kind of play in a random open spot. So if you want to learn how to make like the, the perfect algorithm for how the computer could play to never, ever lose and have no fun playing your game, I'm sure you can find other videos on that. It's not the focus of this here. So essentially what we're going to do here is have the computer pick a random spot between one and nine. And if that spot's available, that's what it's going to pick. So to generate random numbers in Java, um, generally use the random class. So random rand equals new random. And then if you want to make a random int, we'll organize imports, uh, control shift O, or if you need the import, java.util.random. And then the method call to get a random int is called rand.nextInt. So what you can type in is a number and it's going to give you a random int between zero and one less than that number. So what we actually have to do is because we want to get a number between one and nine is we have to get um, a random int between zero and eight and add one to it. And so to do that, we're going to pass in uh, nine. And then we're going to add one to our result. Type this out and we'll go, we'll go over it in a second. So int computer play equals rand.next int nine plus one. So this will give us a random int between zero and eight, but we want the random int to be between one and nine. So we're just going to take the zero to eight, add one to it. And we've got a random number between one and nine. Okay, but what if this spot is already taken by an X or an O? Um, then this play won't work. And so what we have to do is add a check for whether that spot is taken or not. Whether that, if that spot is blank, we're good. If it's not blank, eh, the computer needs to try again. And now we're also probably going to need a way to do that for the player turns too. Um, and so let's just go ahead and make 
a standalone method that just takes in or one of these numbers, one through nine, and just tells you whether or not that space is available with a Boolean. Let's uh, create that method from scratch, right? Private static Boolean, the, the return value is going to be a Boolean, um, is space available. There's a good name for that. And it's going to take in uh, the board and the, uh, whoops, so it's going to be a char double array board and the position, int position. Okay, so a lot of logic is going to match um, exactly what we've got here. So let's go ahead and steal this switch statement from ourselves and paste that up here. So first we want to switch on the position that is sent into this method. And um, of course, since the, this case statement we had before was looking at strings, but here it's taking an int, we're just going to change all these uh, to numbers. Okay, then in all these spots, instead of assigning a value, we just want to return whether or not that space is occupied. So um, to do a character uh, equals check, you can just use double equals. So we can say if this spot on the board is equal to a space, then we can return true, right? And then else, of course, return false. And now uh, you can see this break is dead code because we're either returning true or false when we're in here. There's no way it's going to reach this. So you don't need break statements here. It's an exception. Now, a little small pro tip if you want to clean up this code a little bit, you have if blah, blah, blah equals blank, then return true, else return false. What you can actually do is shortcut this and just return the value of this evaluation here. And so this will do exactly the same thing. It will return true if this is the case. It will just return the truth of value of this statement. So if the board at this spot is equal to blank, it will return true. But it's just a lot less messy code to look at and figure out. So let's just go ahead and copy that for each of these other spots. And actually come to think of it, instead of saying is space available, we can just use like, is this a valid move? So like, and that way, if they put in something like the user puts in something like zero or 10 or something, we can also say that's just not a valid move because so, so it's a little bit more broad and helps us more than just is the space available. Just just makes this method a little bit more useful to us. So let's say is valid move. Okay, so great. Now we've got a method that takes in the board in a position and tells us whether or not that's a valid move. Okay, so then we want to default to false. So if they if they didn't if they so if they entered one, two, three, four, etc., we look in the right spot and tell them whether or not that space is available. But otherwise we return false. That's not a valid move. They can't enter anything except for one through nine. Okay, so right now this isn't called anywhere. So what we want to do is if this computer play, if, it, if it's taken already, if that spot is taken, we want to loop until the computer comes up with a value that is available. So probably the easiest way to do that here is just use a while true loop. And, and then we can just say that if the computer makes a valid move, we can break out of that loop. And then if it doesn't make a valid move and doesn't break out of the loop, it just goes in and tries it again. So we can just say if is valid move, pass in the board pass in our position, which is our computer play. So if that's a valid move, break, and that kicks us out of this while loop. So we know that when we exit this loop, this computer play is a valid move. Great. So now that we have this uh, valid computer play, we want to be able to place that play on the board. Now I'm thinking about it. So we've got this method that allows the player to take a turn and does all of this check logic and assigning. Um, but I think what we can do is refactor this a bit to this section of the logic so we don't have to duplicate this logic anywhere. And it can be either, either take the computer's play or the player's play and put it in the right spot. And this will happen a lot as you're writing your code. If you keep an eye out for it, you might find yourself starting to duplicate something and go, ah, maybe I can reuse some other part of my code. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Basically, the, we don't want to copy the part where the uh, where we ask the user 
what they want to play because we don't need that for the computer. We don't need to use the scanner to get anything from the user. But we do want effectively this part of the, the, the switch statement here. So let's extract this switch statement into its own method. So we, we called it a move before. So I guess we'll just call it place move. Um, let's go ahead and do that. But I think we might have called this a play. Let's rename this to computer move to be consistent throughout um, our code. And we'll even call this uh, player move. Right? And by the way, to rename any clips, you can just uh, be selecting the, the, the method or the variable that you want to rename and hit Alt Shift R. And then you can rename it to whatever you want. And as you can see, it renames it across the entire application. So you don't need to go and copy and paste everywhere like a mental patient. You can just do it in one spot. So now we've got this place move method. Now the, uh, the, the string that comes in won't be the user input. It'll instead be the position that we want to place that move. But we also need to know, since we're going to be using this for the computer plays, the computer moves, and the player moves, we need to know which character we should be putting in there. Because we want this method to be able to be used for both computer and player. So we're going to take a char symbol. That might be a terrible name. Maybe you can come up with a better one. If so, let me know in the comments, because I'm interested in the best name for this, for this variable. So anyway, now we're still going to switch on this position. And in the case of one, we're going to insert the symbol. Now in the case of one, instead of um, always putting an X, we're just going to put in what that symbol is. So again, this can be used for computer or player. And still, if something sends this method a bad number, which it shouldn't, we'll just print out a sad face. Okay, so now that we've made this method that can place a move for either player, um, in this player turn method, we need to actually send it the right stuff. So we're going to send them the user input, which is the position, um, but we also need to send it the symbol. So for a player turn, we want the player to be an X, right? So this is telling this method, hey, when you place this move, put an X in there. So now that works for the player. Now let's hook that up for the computer. So back up here in our main method, it's still in our main method. Um, after we've got the valid computer move, we want to tell this place move method to play the move for the computer. So let's do it. We're going to place move. And what does it take? I can hit uh, control space in Eclipse to show this, uh, this kind of autocomplete. So I need a char board. So if we pass in board, a string position, which we know the computer move is the position and char symbol, which for us is going to be an O for the computer. Now, if you notice, we've got a red underline here, and that's because it's saying, well, computer move can't be resolved to a variable. And that's because it's declared inside the scope of this while loop here. So once it exits the scope, there's no such thing as this variable. So what we actually have to do is take this int and declare it here. Get rid of our int declaration there, and we're good. Except, except, oh no, okay, the method place move char array string char is not compatible with arguments char array int char and that's because this computer move variable is an int and not a string so um, we need to quickly just convert that to a string before we can pass it in and the easiest way to do that is just uh, using the integer dot uh, to string method and you pass in the int that you want to convert to a string and it does it so now i'm great it's happy so now we've added a lot of stuff and refactored a lot of things. So let's real quickly um, assess what we've got and then we're gonna test. So let's see, we're, we're making the board, we're printing the blank board, um, we're declaring scanner. Why are we declaring scanner in here? We only need it inside this player turn method. So actually let's do a little bit more refactoring, get rid of the scanner here. We don't need to pass it in to player turn. We can just go into this player turn method and create our scanner here exactly when we need it. And we'll get rid of scanner input. So you might see this uh, yellow wavy line for this uh, scanner not being closed. It's probably not a big deal in a small program like this, but if you want to be a good little boy scout, you can go ahead and close your scanner here at the end of the method when it's done being used by calling scanner.close. Anyway, back to here. So now we are, um, we create our board, print the blank board, the player takes a turn, and then we do all of this stuff to have the computer play a move and print the board again. 
So that's what we've got so far. We've got the player takes a move, the computer takes a move, and we print the board. So let's go ahead and test and see if all that works. So where would you like to play? Um, let's play in two. Okay, so uh, now the computer made a move on spot four. So awesome, let's try it again. Um, I, I'll play in spot four. Okay, and the computer placed here. Let's just do it a few more times to see if we run into any weirdness. I'm gonna play one, all of one through nine and make sure my stuff gets placed right and uh, if there's any exceptions or anything. Okay, so one thing I am noticing, when I play a six, and it might not be, have been only because of the six, it might have just shown up here at random, but so I played six, and it looks like the computer was able to override that, but it shouldn't be able to do that because we have this is valid move check, and so it should only be doing that if that space isn't occupied. So let's try and figure out what's going on there. Um, and in Eclipse, if you want to go directly to a method that you're looking at, um, like if this is the method call, you can hold control and click the method name and it'll bring you right to that method. So I saw it specifically happen for sixes. Let's look and uh, I can already see the problem. In case six, we've got a copy and paste error. I missed changing this value. It should be um, row one, which is the second row, um, and then spot three, or spot two, which is the third column. That's what should, so that, 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 so that check wasn't working properly, and that's why we got those issues on six. So let's take a second and confirm all the rest of these. Zero, 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 one, zero, two, one, zero, one, 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 two, two, zero, two, one, two, two. Cool. Let's to test six again a few more times. Okay, awesome. It appears to be working now. That's why you test like that. Don't worry about making mistakes like that. You're going to make them. Just make sure you test your programs thoroughly and you'll be able to quickly find and fix your errors. No problem at all. So let's go through the rest of them. We still have 7, 8, 9 to test. Okay, cool. Now that all appears to be working. Now, of course, we've only got I take a turn, the computer takes a turn, and then the game's over. Um, so we've got to fix that. So let's go ahead and um, first let's clean this up just a little bit so that this also oh, all of this code here is to make the computer take a turn so let's go ahead and extract that to a method so we can reuse it all we want and we'll call it a computer turn so now when we want the computer to take a turn we just call this method i guess it would be nice to be able to see the board between turns so uh, we're just going to add in another uh, print board here between these turns it would also just be nice to see a little printout a sentence of where the computer chose to put their move. So let's go to the uh, computer turn method and just add a little statement for that. Let's give that all a quick test because we just rearranged a lot of stuff. Let's make sure we did it right. Where would you like to play? One. Computer chose nine. Bam. Okay, so now, um, of course, the, we only have one move for me and one move for the computer. So um, let's go ahead and just add in a little simple wild true loop to just keep it going back and forth. So basically we're going to have the player take a turn, print the board, have the computer take a turn, print the board, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So let's go ahead and um, just copy this up here and we'll do a while. We, we, might, we might make this a little more fancy in the future, but for now we're just going to do a while true. And it might stay that way. We're just going to loop through this forever. And of course, now this is dead code, so it's going to complain. We're going to comment it out for now. So let's give it a test. Where would you like to play? One. Hmm. So I see an exception when it was trying to prompt me um, for where I want to play next. And I think it could be because um, I'm recreating this scanner. Maybe I do need to just have one scanner at the top that's passed in everywhere. So um, let's see if that solves the issue. Go ahead and grab this scanner and put it back where it was. And, but then we have to pass that into the player turn again. If you didn't know a quick way to do that, so say you want to add a parameter to this method, but you don't have to actually go to this method and type in that extra parameter. You can just slap it in as a parameter here, and then it'll say, hey, the method is not applicable for these arguments. Well, you can just say, hey, change the method to add that parameter. And then you can see it automatically does it. How awesome is that? Now let's retest. By the way, I'm hitting Control F11 to run my program instead of having to come up to run, run, or click this button, Control F11. Where would you like to play? One. Oh, I also forgot I'm closing the scanner and I can't be doing that uh, after every turn. So let's go back into player turn, get rid of this scanner close, 
and we're going to put that at the end of the program. So we, at the beginning of the program, we create our new scanner, we do everything we need to do, and then at the end of the program, um, well, actually, let's put it here. At the end, we can't even put it at the end right now because this is dead code, um, because we have a while true loop here that we never can get out of. So let's just put it here, comment it out, so we remember it for later. Be a good Boy Scout and close your scanner. And now we're going to test again. But this is how programming works. You're going to you're going to write some code, think everything is going to be just fine, see a problem, figure it out, fix it, move on. Where would you like to play? One. Computer chose three. Where would you like to play? Two. Computer chose six. Where would you like to play? Now, one thing I'm thinking I may have forgotten about is I don't know if it's validating my moves. It makes sure the computer is putting it in a valid spot, but I don't think it's checking mine. So let's see if I can expose that bug by trying to choose spot three right now. And yes, I can. So right now this program allows me to cheat. Let's go ahead and fix that. So what we're going to need to go and fix is this player turn method. So let's hop into this player turn method. So we've of course got this uh, system.outprint line. Uh, where would you like to play? And then we use the scanner to get that input from the user. Well, what we need to do before we just place the move is um, make sure it's valid, just like we did for the uh, computer move. And so again, we're going to put this in a while true loop. Um, if it's a valid move, we'll break out of that loop. Otherwise, we uh, will just repeat that loop until we have a valid move. And remember our method name, what was our method name called? By the way, hit control O to open up the outline of all the methods here I have in this class. So it's called uh, is valid move. And it takes the board and the int position. Okay, so we're going to call that is valid move, takes the board, in an int position, but our position is a string that comes from the user. So we're going to have to convert our user input to an int. And, um, and to do that quickly, we're just going to use an integer dot parse int. Cool. Now we just need to add our if statement. If is valid move, then we know we've got a valid move and we can break out of our loop and place the move on the board. But again, we have the same problem we did before where this user input can't be resolved to a variable. And that's because, again, it's declared inside the scope of this while true loop. We need to change it to be declared outside the scope of that loop so it can be used outside that loop. So now again, let's test. Okay, where would you like to play? One. So the computer placed at seven. Let's see if I can override it at seven. <laughs> no, I cannot. It's making me put it in again. But let's put in a useful message to the user. Um, so just else if it's not a valid move so we can just print out hey that's that's not a valid move we can copy this paste that in there and we're going to tell them your input user input plus is is not a valid move so then they can try again let's retest seven is not a valid move where would you like to play seven seven is not a valid move where would you like to play Five. Okay, five's good, and it continues. So now let's let's keep going. Um, two. Computer chose nine. And as you can already see, we've got to put in some logic to see if it's the end of the game. But for now, let's just keep going. Let's put it in spot three. Okay, down the only spot left is six. Now, as you can see, it kind of looks like it froze. But I have my suspicion that um, it probably didn't freeze. It's probably churning right now in a while loop and I bet if I open my uh, task manager I'll be able to see that yeah we're using a ton of CPU in Eclipse and that's probably because the uh, first of all let, let's kill this program before it kills my computer now I'm thinking it's looking it's in the middle of this computer turn right now and it's in the middle of this while true loop where the where the computer um, gets a random int between one and nine and checks if it's a valid move and if it's not it just tries again well, it's out of valid move, so it's going to just do this forever unless we fix it. That brings us to the final main chunk of our program where we have to determine if the game is over. And then if the game is over, who won or is it a tie? So let's just think about that. Where do we want that in our, um, in our code here? So we've got the player takes a turn, we print the board, the computer takes a turn, we print the board, and then we keep going through that loop. So I think after each turn, we can have some code for is the game over? And if it is over, we kick it out of this loop. Um, but we don't need to actually write all of that is the game over 
code here, we can just call a method that does that, just like we have player turn, print board, and whatever. So we can actually use the IDE to make the shell of that method really quickly right here. So let's say we want to call it is game finished. And we would of course need to pass in the board so we can read the stuff on the board to see if the game's finished. Well, it's like, oh, well, this method is undefined. Well, you can just hover over this and say, okay, create it. And then we can control click the method name and it'll bring us to the method stub that it created. And now we just need to write our implementation of is game finished here. So now we've got, we got to think we've got a couple of different ways that the game could be finished. Either we could have a winner um, where somebody gets three in a row one way or another, you know, across or diagonal or up and down. Or the board is full and there's nothing else anybody can do and it's a tie. So first I think we should check, is there a winner? And then second, if we get a no, there isn't a winner, we just check if the board is full. And I'm thinking before we start writing this, we want this method to return a Boolean for whether the game is finished. That's why we called it is game finished. And we wanna take the result of this, if the game is finished, then we want to break from our loop. So we wanna do that after the player's turn and after the computer's turn. So, okay, so now let's implement our is game finished method. So right now it's a, right now it's just angry because we aren't returning any booleans yet. We we will, but for now just to make it happy, um, we'll just add a, a return statement so it so it's happy. First, let's go ahead and write the check for if the board is full because I think that'll honestly just be easier to do. So so what we want to do for checking if the if the board is full is just loop through this entire board, and if just one of them is blank, we know that the the board isn't full yet. So how are we going to loop through that 2D array? Well, we're going to have a nested for loop. We're going to have one for loop that goes through each of these rows, and then one for loop that goes through each of the columns in each of those rows. So in our is game finished method, where we're checking for a full board, we're going to do for uh, int i, the classic for loop uh, variable. We're going to loop through the, the, the length of the board array, so that's until i, while i is less than board dot length, i plus plus, and then inside of that, we're gonna loop through the, the columns. So for int j, the secondary classic for loop variable, j less than board i dot length, j plus plus. Oh, and I see I just forgot to initialize these to zero. Gotta remember that. So this might look a little bit confusing, but what that enables me to do is look at board i j and find out exactly what's there in that spot in the board. So I know this nested for loop is going to loop through every position in the board one by one. So what we can do is check board i j equal to blank. And if that's the case, we can say if board ij equals blank, then return false. So what that does is loop through the whole board. As soon as we find one blank spot, we know it's not full and the game's not finished. And if it gets through this whole for loop and never finds a blank spot, well, we got to return true. The game's over. Again, let's go ahead and test it. And then cool, it worked. Um, it ended the program. It's, it's not in some infinite while loop or anything like that. Um, it just ended, but uh, we didn't put in any message or anything. We didn't print the ending board. So let's go ahead and do that here. And um, we also want to print what happened. So what happened here is if the game is full, it, it ended in a tie, nobody won. Let's go ahead and test that. The game ended in a tie, awesome. So that's, now that's all working great. What we have left to do is write the code to determine if there is a winner and not just check for a full board. So we're gonna write it here in our is game finished method. So again, we're gonna check to see if anybody won. And if nobody won, we do this is the board full check. So thinking about the way we wanna implement this check for whether there's a winner. So I, the way I see it, there's, there's only so many different possibilities. So we might as well just hard code each one. We don't have to write some clever mathematical method. We can just check all of them. There's only so many of them. So we could have the three rows, one, two, three. You could win in any of those ways. The three columns, one, two, three. So that's six total. And then each diagonal, 
7 and 8. So we've only got 8 different possibilities to code for. So first let's, I think let's write all of these as if we're checking to see if the player, the human player, won. Um, and then we'll kind of uh, refactor it a little bit so we can either check for the player or computer. So let's go ahead and just write all of those checks. Let's start with the first one, the first row. So we're going to check if all of this first row are x's, then player one one. So we got if board zero zero equals x and board zero one equals x. And I'm going to copy it for the last one here. And board zero two equals x. So that's the condition for the first row, right? And then we just need an or condition for the second row and the third row and the fourth. So we're just gonna have one big giant if statement here for all of this. We're gonna contain all of that in some parentheses here. Or we're gonna copy all of this if player one wins on the second row. And the second row is just everything changed but with a one here. Check the third row, so we've got two zero, 2, 1, and 2, 2. So now we got all of our rows checked. Let's check all the columns. And so let's just copy this whole thing. We know we've got three checks for columns. Let's go ahead and put that here. So our columns are going to be, um, we've got 0, 0, 1, 0, and 2, 0. So this is 0, 0, this is 1, 0, and this is 2, 0. We're going to do our second column, which is just taking this uh, first column check and then just changing all of these uh, to a 1. And then we take for the third column check, we take all of these and change them all to a 2. And so now for the diagonal checks, we have just two of them. And so that's 0, 0, and then 1, 1, and 2, 2, and 0, 2, 1, 1, and 2, 0. So I think that's right. So now we've got our check for this whole check should, should check it did the player win. So now we've just got to end our um, if statement here. So if all any of these things happened, if the player won like this or the player won like this or the player won like this, then we want to print out system that out that print line player wins. But we also want to uh, print the board. And we want to return true because the game ended. We want to return uh, true because the game finished. Let's go for it. Let's run some tests. Let's see if I can beat the computer playing absolutely randomly. One, computer chose eight. I want to choose two. Computer chose seven. I'm going to choose three. And I win. I'm a genius. Wow. Whew. I'm going to try and go through all of these options and win with all of them so I know that these checks actually work because it's super easy to make a copy paste error in something that looks like this. So I am realizing while I'm testing this that when the player enters an invalid value, it doesn't tell them what's wrong. It, it loops through it, right? And makes you put in the right value, but it doesn't tell you that that value was wrong. So let's find the player turn method to fix that. So if it's a valid move, great, we break. Otherwise we print out, well, we, we got started with it, uh, but we didn't finish it. So we're printing out user input uh, is not a valid move. And now let's uh, keep testing. So awesome, I just got done testing all eight possible win scenarios for the player and they all work. So that's perfect, awesome. But right now we're only checking if the player wins. We're gonna have to now modify this to check whether the computer's winning also. So in order to do that, the first thing I'm going to do is extract all of this code, this whole big check into a method by itself and allow the symbol that you're looking for to be sent in as a parameter. So when we wanna check if the player won, we can send an X to the method. And when we wanna check if the computer won, we can just send an O to the method. And we don't have to rewrite all this code or have duplication of a lot of the same kinds of checks. So first we wanna take out um, the printing the board and, and saying that the player won inside of this method. Um, we'll take that out and put that here because, because we don't want the method that just determines whether a player or a computer won to be responsible for also printing out the board and printing out that the player won. We'd like to just separate those concerns a little bit. So let's go ahead and extract all of this logic to a method right now, Alt-Shift-M, maybe has contestant 
one. There's also the name of a method I don't love, but I can't think of a better one. So if you can think of a better one, please let me know in the comments. I'd love to get a better one here. And now we can see that the automatically generated um, method shell here thinks it's a void method because we didn't have a return statement um, for every possible branch here. And we actually want to return a Boolean here for whether the uh, contestant has won. So of course, if it meets any of these criteria, we return a true. And if it gets outside of that, we can return false because it didn't meet all those criteria. And you don't need to have an else statement here because if any of these conditions are met, it will return true and we'll already have left the method. And if it gets to this point, we know that none of these conditions are met and we can just return false. We don't need an else. And remember here, we also want to take in the character of the symbol that we're looking for, whether it's uh, the O for the computer or the X for the player. And then instead of explicitly looking for X everywhere here, we want to instead look for symbol. So let's do a quick find and replace here so I don't have to go insane pasting everything. Oh, and I just realized I spelled constant instead of contestant. Got constants on the brain. So now the check for whether the player has won is a call to has contestant won, where we send in the board, and the uh, letter X as the symbol. So now we can say if this contestant has won, this contestant being the player, then we know that uh, the player has won. So we can print that out here. And then we do want to return true here still, because this still is the method that determines whether the game is finished. We want to say, yeah, the game is finished. So now um, to do the check for whether the computer won, it's exactly the same, except um, we have to look for an O. And then we can say, if that's the case, the computer wins. So again, let's give it a test. First, let's test um, if I can win still. I'll I play one and then four and then seven, and player wins. I'm gonna try and let the computer win, but of course it kind of plays dumb. It plays completely randomly. So we'll just see what happens. Computer wins. O got three in a row, and that worked out. I mean, how awesome is that, right? And all this is not too hard. I mean, it's all simple programming concepts just, just combined in a way that you can make a simple, working, great tic-tac-toe game complete with a computer opponent super quickly. Now, one thing I do want to address because I'm super picky as a programmer about having everything be super clean is right now, I think when you enter something that isn't a number, it'll blow up. So what I'm saying is right now, if I enter like this, it explodes with a number format exception. Now, why is that? That is because in the player turn method, when we gather the user input, the, the move from the player, we immediately try to parse an integer from it in order to call this is valid move method with an integer. So there's a couple of ways we could take care of that. We could do like a try catch around this, uh, this parse int here. And there's an example of how to do that kind of input validation in this GPA calculator video right here. But I think what we can do instead here is just change this is valid move method to accept a string instead of an integer. And then we can just pass the string directly to this method and we don't have to ever uh, convert it to an integer. We can just check the string the user enters against strings of one or two or whatever. So first let's change this method to instead take a string of a position and then we'll fix all the little syntax errors that Eclipse tells us about after we do that. To me it's kind of easier that way. Just make the change that you want and then let Eclipse flag all the places that you need to change to accommodate that. So we'll just change this to a string position and then uh, of course we need to change all these two strings. So now here at the end, if I send in some garbage that isn't a valid move and isn't even a valid number, it doesn't matter. It'll just default and return false. Hey, that's not a valid move and it won't explode with this number format exception anymore. So, and then we'll go down to where we're calling that method from the player turn. And instead of parsing an int from this user input, we just send the user input as a string directly. Perfect. But now there is one other place where that method is called and that's inside the computer turn. Now for the computer turn, remember, it does send in an int because it uses this rand.next int in order to produce the random move it wants to make. But all we need to do to fix that is just use another method called integer.toString and pass in that move to convert it to a string. And you might be thinking, well, aren't we just replacing one problem with another? Well, no, all ints uh, can be converted into a string. Any series of numbers is also going to be a valid string, so we won't have the same formatting exceptions as we would converting a string to an integer. So that should be all we have to do. Let's go ahead and test the user input validation now. Put in my garbage, and it says it's not a valid move. 
Awesome. And then I can say one. And of course, one is a valid move, so it accepts it. And, and I like doing stuff like that, being able to validate the user input like that. So it, it doesn't create a bad experience for the user. If somebody's playing your tic-tac-toe game and they accidentally type something that isn't a number, it doesn't just blow up on them and make them start over. It adapts to the situation and allows you to put in the correct input. And that's what a good program should always do. Got to be a good Boy Scout with your programs. So now one other thing, um, we just have some commented code that we don't need anymore that we can get rid of. Let's go ahead and get rid of this. I don't, I still think we're not closing our scanner. So let's go ahead and do that at the end of the program. And so, yeah, now at the end here, let's go ahead and like zoom out and just get a high level view of this program and, and what it looks like. Zoom on out here. There's not a whole lot to it. I think it's what, 173 lines. And that's with a bunch of these blank lines and stuff. There's not a whole lot to it. And we probably could whittle it down a little bit more if we really wanted to. Uh, but we don't really have to. This is a very simple program that you can make tic-tac-toe with. Another thing I like about it is the main method is very simple. All it does is set up the board, print it, and then do the player turn and the computer turn in the loop, and then stop. And all the complexity is broken down into these other methods, so it's really easy to keep in your brain how it works when you're looking at an individual part of this. And that's kind of a mark of a good program, too. You don't want one big giant main method where it's really hard to just keep in your brain what's happening at any given time. For any part of this, you can look at that method and understand what it's doing. And you can break it down too. Like I can go into the player turn method. So I can see it's getting input from the user, validating it, and then placing that move on the board. And that's it, it's super dead simple. Each method has one job and it does it well. And it does exactly what you would think it would do by the name of it. So I think that's gonna be it today, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Now remember, the whole source code that you're looking at here is available in a link down in the description. So go grab it, take a look at it, make it better, rearrange stuff, play with it, have fun. If you enjoyed this video, got some value out of it, had some fun making tic-tac-toe, please give me a like. It means so much. It's so appreciated. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, please be sure to subscribe. All right, that's it. Till next time, guys, keep at it. Happy programming, and I will see you in the next video.